afternoon. This afternoon, first item of business is portfolio questions, and the questions are on education and lifelong learning. As ever, if answers are and questions are short and succinct, then we may get through more questions. Question number one, unfortunately not lodged, when and a less than satisfactory explanation provided. And therefore, I call question number two, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the University and College Union and which issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. President Officer, I last met with a representative of the University and College Union as part of a wider meeting to discuss the Higher Education Governance Bill on the 20th of May this year. Thank you. Claire Baker. I am pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has been meeting UCU over the Higher Education Bill. Uh, the, Minister, sorry, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of press reports raising concerns over the threat to the future of the well-respected Religious Studies Department at Stirling University. My understanding is that these changes have been raised without recourse to the Court or the Academic Council. Is the Cabinet Secretary confident that the Higher Education Bill recommendations will go far enough in improving university governance and accountability in cases such as this? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I thank the member for her question. I certainly uh, have indeed been aware of the, the press coverage uh, over the potential uh, closure of the uh, Department of Religious Studies at the University uh, of Stirling. I'm also aware that it is the only place to study religion um, without being in a, a Christian uh, faculty of uh, theology. Now, obviously, universities are autonomous um, and they are responsible for managing uh, their own course provisions. I do, of course, um, expect them to manage their fears uh, in the spirit of consulting with staff, uh, trade unions, and always to minimise any impact on students. Uh, and, you know, in keeping uh, with the Higher Education Governance Bill, um, the whole uh, residence of that bill is to ensure that every voice on campus is actually heard and that all interests, whether staff, students, academic, uh, are heard within the governing body. Many thanks. Question number three, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how the Higher Education Governance Scotland Bill will maintain democracy in universities. Cabinet Secretary. Ministers see this bill as creating a framework which strengthens our higher education sector, its institutions and traditions. To achieve that, it needs to be meaningful legislation which opens up the architecture of an institution to be more diverse, <coughs> inclusive and representative. At its heart, the bill seeks to enable every voice on campus to be heard. Many thanks. Madhu Fraser. Uh, I thank the Minister for her response. Despite the assurances she has given the sector, we heard evidence uh, this week at this Parliament's Education Committee from key leaders within the university sector who are concerned about the unintended consequences of the bill. Why does she disagree with David Ross, who is the chair of the Committee of Scottish Chairs, who yesterday reiterated his belief that the bill in its current form could damage accountability and diminish democracy within Scottish universities? Cabinet Secretary. Of course, what uh, Mr Fraser fails to recognise was that there were a range of views and opinions expressed yesterday uh, at uh, the Education Committee. Um, there are you know, a wide spectrum of views. It is important to recognise that while um, some senior voices uh, in the world of higher education have concerns uh, in relation to the bill, uh, there are other voices that are of equal importance, uh, whether that's staff, whether that's in the student bodies, or or indeed uh, in the, the, the trade union movement. And it is important to consider uh, all the views of all the stakeholders uh, in the round. And at its heart, uh, this bill is about ensuring that our world-class higher education system <coughs> continues to evolve and remains fit for 21st century Scotland. And I don't think asking for the highest standards of governance. Um, I don't think we're unreasonable uh, to expect that, given that it's the taxpayer that invests a billion pounds uh, every year in higher education. Supplementary from Jim Eady. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. In considering the views of all of the stakeholders, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the highly valued role of rector will continue, and will she give an assurance that the rector will still be able to chair the university court as part of Scotland's proud academic and democratic traditions. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thanks to Mr Reedy. The Scottish Government appreciates the very valuable role that rectors play in the ancient universities. 
they have raised the profile uh, of the sector uh, and they have also been crucial in representing students and we have absolutely no intention at all of abolishing uh, the position of rector. We are listening to the views of all stakeholders on how elected chairs uh, will work in all of our institutions and we will consider all constructive uh, suggestions uh, raised in evidence as we debate uh, the detail of the bill um, in Parliament. Uh, it is important to stress that rectors uh, have kept the, the spirit of democracy alive uh, within higher education and it is that spirit of democracy, transparency and accountability that we would like to extend uh, to every higher education institution in Scotland. Many thanks. Question number four, Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet the head of Scotland's Rural College. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I have no current plans to meet with the head of Scotland's Rural College. However, if there are issues that the SRUC would like to discuss, uh, I would, of course, be more than happy to do so. Joan McAlpine. I thank the Minister for that answer. SRUC recently failed to agree a merger with Edinburgh University and I'm concerned about the impact of this development on my region, most notably at Barony College in Dumfries. There's concern locally that SRUC senior management do not value the FE provision at Barony and are selling off assets to pay for management failures. Yet the SRUC accounts show the principal salary was £280,000 last year. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the absolute priority of SRUC should not be inflated senior salaries, but providing a wide range of training and education to all levels, including FE, to boost employment in rural Scotland and meet the needs of land-based industries, including farming? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, of course, the priority should always be to provide educational opportunities that boost uh, employment. Uh, I am uh, acutely aware of the importance of agricultural skills uh, to the economy in Dumfries and Galloway uh, and understand why the member and the community are keen to ensure a continued presence uh, for the, the SRUC at the Barony campus. I understand that the SRUC remains committed to delivering land-based education and training uh, in Dumfries, uh, but of course I would be you know, happy to discuss this uh, with Ms McAlpine and uh, a representative from SRUC further. Many thanks. Question number five, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that the recent reforms to the Protecting Vulnerable Groups scheme are sufficient. Minister Aileen Campbell. Yes, we believe that the reforms of the disclosure and rehabilitation regimes in Scotland that took place on the 10th of September strike the right balance between public protection and the right of an individual who has spent convictions for less serious offences and who has put their past offending behaviour behind them to move on with their life. The reforms will continue to ensure that vulnerable groups are protected and that the background of an individual seeking to work with children and protected adults is assessed for relevant convictions. To that end, convictions for serious offences will continue to be disclosed even if spent. Siobhan McMahon. I thank the Minister for that answer and I fully accept the need for additional scrutiny of a person's background if that individual wants to work with vulnerable groups or in other sensitive roles. However, I am aware of a case where my constituent has had other relevant information placed on his protection of vulnerable group scheme record at the request of the then Chief Constable of Strathclyde Police. Despite my constituent approaching Disclosure Scotland, Police Scotland and the Information Commissioner's Office, he has been unable to obtain details of the other relevant information held on his file, which has now had a detrimental effect on his coach and taxi business. What recourse, if any, does my constituent have in this situation? In addition, can the Minister advise me whether there will be any plans when Parliament has a further opportunity to scrutinise these reforms to change this, particularly anomaly? Minister. Um, and I thank the Member for raising uh, the issue. And um, there are, I think it's important to realise that this is about making sure that it's a proportionate regime that's in place to make sure that people can move on with their lives. However, that has to be balanced up with making sure that the right information is there to the people to make good decisions about who is going to be working with people, for instance, with uh, vulnerable uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, we are in a period of consultation over, uh, since the Cabinet Secretary made the statement uh, to Parliament, and I'm happy to meet with the member to hear from her the specifics of the case that she's involved with to see if that can uh, help uh, move that issue forward, but also uh, to make any uh, other meetings or uh, any other kind of uh, representations that she wants to make with the Justice Minister to make that available to her as well. Many thanks. Question number six, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met Inverclyde Council to discuss education matters. 
Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Uh, we are in frequent contact with Inverclyde Council presiding officer about a, a wide range of education matters. Uh, in particular, Dr Allen performed the sword cutting ceremony for the new St Patrick's Primary School in Greenock on the 23rd of September and I attended the launch of the Inverclyde Council's Attainment Challenge on the 14th of August as one of their keynote speakers. Stuart McMillan. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. And as a result of the, of the Tory cuts to working tax credits, 22,000 children between 3 and 15 years old in Scotland will lose their entitlement to free school meals. And can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how Inverclyde Council will be expected to actually deal with these Tory cuts and whether there is anything that can be done to mitigate the effects of this attack on the least well-off in Inverclyde and Scotland who stand to lose their entitlement to free school meals and childcare? Cabinet Secretary. The um, Scottish Government will always act to protect the rights of disadvantaged children uh, and their entitlement to free school meals and early learning and childcare, uh, whether that's in Inverclyde or across Scotland. Uh, Mr McMillan highlights the, the impact of changes to working tax credits and child tax credits made uh, in the UK summer budget and the potential impact uh, of these nationally. 22,000 pupils losing their entitlement to a free school meal and 2,000 uh, two-year-olds uh, losing their entitlement to early learning and childcare. So, consequently, presiding officer, two weeks ago, I pledged to safeguard the entitlements of thousands of children from lower-income households uh, by changing the regulations in Scotland to ensure that they remain eligible for free school meals and early learning and childcare. And, as a government, we remain committed to tackling child poverty head-on, despite the challenges from the UK government. Thank you. Question number seven, Graham Day. Thank you. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what evidence it is aware of that energy drink consumption by pupils during the school day may impact on classroom behaviour. Minister Aileen Campbell. The nutritional requirements for food and drink in Schools Scotland Regulations 2008 contain standards that all drinks provided in schools must meet. These regulations do not allow any energy drinks to be made available at any time of the school day. We will continue to monitor all evidence on energy drinks and carefully consider recommendations made in relation to their sale to children and young people. Graham Day. So, but I hear from secondary school teachers that the classroom environment they encounter post lunchtime across S2 to S4 can be a disrupted one with pupils easily distracted, they believe, due to the purchase and consumption of these products from off the school campus. And down south, the teaching union NASUWT and drug and alcohol charity Swanswell have teamed up to look into this situation regarding energy drink consumption by pupils. Can I ask the Minister what steps might be taken to determine the scale of the problem here in Scotland? Minister. Um, the member raises a very serious point, uh, but the exemption that I mentioned applies to food and drink, including energy drinks being brought into the school by a pupil, for example, as part of a packed lunch or purchased at a shop outside the school gates. However, the School Health Promotion and Nutritional Scotland Act requires education authorities to make health promotion a central purpose of schooling and allowing children to consume unhealthy products such as energy drinks on school premises would run contrary to that message. So, for that reason, schools are encouraged to consider this when setting their own policies about what products they allow their pupils to bring into the school. I am, however, uh, willing to meet with Mr Day and to discuss some of the issues that he has raised, uh, if he so wishes. Many thanks. A supplementary from Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, North Lanarkshire Council have banned fast food vans from within 250 metres um, of schools in an effort to improve the health and wellbeing of their pupils. A decision which has already been taken by Glasgow and East Ayrshire Council. Can I ask the Minister if the Scottish Government support the Council's efforts to improve the health of pupils through bans and snack vans. What assistance can the Government give the Council on fighting the legal challenge to the ban? And does the Minister feel that the Education Bill would be an appropriate um, place to table an amendment to give local authorities the, the additional powers in this area that may be needed as a result of the legal challenge? Minister. Uh, notwithstanding the, the legal issues that the, the member raises, and I wouldn't want to wish to, to comment on some of those if they're ongoing. However, we would uh, expect and hope that uh, local authorities make best use of the current rules and regulations that are available to them through uh, some of the uh, provisions that he mentioned, but also so through some of the uh, legislative kind of requirements that I mentioned in response to Graham Day to make best use to ensure that they're creating healthy environments around their schools. And of course, decisions around uh, the environment surrounding schools rest solely with uh, local authorities. But um, yeah, I hope that gives them some comfort that we want to help promote healthy uh, activities within school and that rules and regulations are there to support local authorities. Thank you. Question number eight, Colin Beattie. 
To ask the Scottish Government how it will work with further and higher education institutions to ensure that students in receipt of employment and support allowance will not find their education disrupted when, when universal credit is rolled out. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. The Scottish Government has long made clear we have great concerns about the impl implementation of universal credit. Uh, we welcome the limited powers over universal credit proposed in the Scotland Bill and are working to implement these as soon as possible. But this will not be enough to protect students from all aspects of universal credit or indeed the UK Government's uh, welfare reforms. Uh, we are, however, working closely with the Scottish Funding Council, Colleges Scotland and Child Poverty Action Group uh, to monitor and assess uh, the impact for students. Thank you. Colin Beatty. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Many of the students from deprived areas in my constituency of Midlothian, North and Musselburgh benefit greatly from this allowance. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the allowance has contributed to the reduction of the attainment gap across Scotland? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Officer, I am aware that a part-time student can claim a contributory ESA if they have contributions or income-related ESA or if they are on a low income without having uh, to also be receiving DLA or uh, PIP. Uh, so therefore, you mean this allowance it has supported uh, disadvantaged students to access uh, educational opportunities uh, and has helped to address uh, inequalities in educational uh, outcome uh, as outlined by Mr Beattie. Um, as I've made clear, the uh, Scottish Government uh, continues to have concerns about the implementation uh, of universal uh, credit. If the member wishes to write to me to outline these matters uh, in greater detail, I would be more than happy to ensure that these are fed into any discussions uh, that this Government is having uh, with the UK Government on employment and support allowance. Thank you. Question number nine, Gil Patterson. Many thanks, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures is putting in place to improve early years education. Minister Aileen Campbell. We have invested £329 million over two years to increase entitlement to 600 hours of early learning and childcare for all three and four year olds and to 27 per cent of two year olds who will benefit the most. Around 20,000 two year olds from the poorest families will be eligible over the course of the year. We also intend to almost double funded provision to 1,140 hours per year by the end of the next Parliament. Thank you. Gil Patterson. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that uh, answer? The Minister will be aware that the welfare changes by the UK Government means almost 2,000 two-year-olds uh, would lose their entitlement to early years education. Can I ask the Minister what precautions, uh, protections is the Government putting in place to protect children and do they have the additional resources to do so? Minister. Um, the member makes a good point and I think shows 2,000 reasons why that change was wrong. And as the Cabinet Secretary said in her answer to Stuart Macmillan, she uh, changed the regulations in Scotland to ensure that uh, those two-year-olds remain eligible for free school meals and early learning uh, and childcare. Uh, we will always put our children and young people first in our efforts to create the fairer country that we seek. Uh, and this uh, underpins our commitment to getting it right for every child and the legislative changes that we made through the Children and Young People Act. And we'll always want to ensure that all children get the best start in life and the start and the chance to flourish. And we'll continue to do this despite what seems to be uh, the efforts and the challenges the UK government seems to present to us in our uh, efforts to pursue that. Many thanks. A supplementary from Cara Hilton. Um, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Um, given that children living in poverty are twice as likely to experience early language difficulties between the ages of three and five, what specific measures will the Minister be taking to address the attainment gap that develops before children start school? And will the Minister consider making early literacy a focus of in inspections? Minister. We have got a huge commitment to ensuring that the attainment gap is narrowed and that has been evidenced through the recent Read Write Count campaign which builds on the great success that our Play Talk Read campaign promoting efforts and e messages that parents should play talk read with their little ones from day one because we know that that uh, benefits uh, those literacy uh, challenges. Uh, I would point the member to the recently uh, uh, published GUS information which shows that we are making some good progress in terms of literacy and also will uh, uh, ensure that she can contribute contribute to our thinking around how we make sure that we can continue to close that gap and, uh, in the, in the, uh, in, and focus on early years as the best place to start that. Thank you. Question number 10, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government uh, what it is doing to address the reported uh, teacher shortage in the North East. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. 
Presiding officer, we have increased student teacher intake targets in each of the last four years, committed £51 million to safeguard teaching posts and launched a teacher recruitment campaign. I welcome the invitation to attend the Teacher Recruitment Summit in Aberdeen last week. We discussed the positive work that the Scottish Government and local authorities are doing and explored the scope uh, to build on this work. I have written to the seven local authorities concerned, setting out proposals for further action, including extending the provision of part-time distance learning, initial teacher education and incorporating uh, regional workforce intelligence uh, into the national workforce planning process on a more structured basis. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, does the Minister agree that it is important to local communities that young people in particular who may have had to leave the area to study elsewhere can find employment in their own local area? In this context, uh, what is the Scottish Government doing to encourage routes into teaching for people, especially the young and newly trained who live in the north or are attached to the North East? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I agree entirely with that sentiment and the government is committed to working with local authorities and universities to develop uh, routes into teaching which enable people uh, to remain within their local area. Uh, this is why we have uh, brought the University of Highlands and Islands on stream as an initial teacher education provider. It's why we have increased the number of student places uh, for initial teacher education across Scotland but especially at the universities of Aberdeen, Dundee and the west of Scotland. Uh, Aberdeenshire is one of the local authorities to have benefited from the funding that the government provided to the University of Aberdeen to enable them to develop the part-time distance learning PGDE course, uh, to enable uh, partner local authorities to develop existing staff as primary teachers on a part-time basis while continuing in their employment. And it was clear from the teacher summit last week that this innovation has been uh, widely uh, welcomed by the local authorities. And I've asked my officials to uh, speak to partners to explore how uh, this, uh, in, uh, the Delight programme could be extended to the secondary sector. Thank you. Supplementary from Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. Many qualified and experienced primary and secondary school teachers are available and ready to work, uh, particularly in Murray, next door to the North East, but due to having an English qualification, are not recognised by the GTC. So can a solution be found to this as soon as possible so that children in Murray are not sent home again this winter due to teacher shortages? Cabinet Secretary. It's important to recognise that it is crucial that teachers uh, in Scottish schools uh, have qualifications to teach, and I'm sure that Mrs Scanlon would uh, agree with that uh, very important point. It is, however, also worth recognising that the GTCS, who were actually at uh, the summit in Aberdeen, uh, already um, register uh, teachers from south of the border and do so in large numbers. Uh, but Mrs Scanlon might also be interested to note that the GTCS have recently just finished a consultation on what I believe would be two very important proposals that would uh, introduce more flexibility into the system uh, that would be helpful you know, across Scotland, but particularly to, to Murray and uh, the North East. And one proposal is around equivalency uh, testing and the other proposal is around uh, registration that is provisional, provisional registration on certain conditions being met within uh, a timescale. And I hope that she'll agree with me that that shows a great willing on the part of the GTCS uh, to maintain standards always, but where possible to show flexibility. Thank you. Question number 11, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with local authorities regarding the impact of the agreement to maintain teacher numbers. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has committed £51 million to safeguard teaching posts and we have been in regular discussions uh, with local authorities to support them uh, to meet their commitment to maintain teacher numbers and pupil-teacher ratios uh, at 2014 levels. Thank you. Lee MacArthur. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The Education Committee recently heard concerns from representatives of local authorities across Scotland that the Scottish Government's decision to set strict teacher limits for each individual council 
has removed the flexibility they need to match demand for teachers with supply. It was also suggested that in order to meet the government's demands, imposed via the threat of a £50 million cut to their budgets, councils are having to lay off support staff. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore confirm how many janitors, cleaners, kitchen and other administrative and support staff have lost their jobs since the deal was put in place? What estimates have been made uh, about the further job losses over coming years? And does she believe that the loss of these posts is in keeping with the government's stated commitment to meeting the needs of the lower paid? Cabinet Secretary. I would have hoped that uh, Mr MacArthur would have agreed with me that uh, going the extra mile to uh, maintain teacher numbers at the 2014 uh, level was a very important and crucial step uh, to take, particularly as we are embarking on a journey where we are all across this chamber and across every local authority in Scotland increasing our resolve to close uh, the attainment gap. And we know uh, that good uh, quality, professional, uh, graduate teaching workforce is crucial to that. It is important uh, to stress to Mr MacArthur that um, every local authority entered uh, into this agreement uh, with the government, but of course it is no secret that this government would indeed have preferred a national uh, agreement as opposed to having uh, 32 separate agreements. And in the weeks and months ahead, we will certainly continue to have a dialogue with local authorities, but also our partners in COSLA to uh, see if we can make progress on that area. Thank you. Supplementary, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the particular challenges of recruiting and maintaining teachers in rural areas like Dumfries and Galloway. What is the Scottish Government doing to help the Council maintain its teacher numbers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, Ms McAlpine uh, raises a point in the same way that there have been recruitment and retention uh, issues in the north east of Scotland. Similarly, there have been challenges in Dumfries uh, and Galloway. Uh, the Government is committed to working in partnership uh, with local authorities, the university, and as I indicated in an earlier uh, answer, with the, the GTCS, uh, as well as other professional associations, to explore uh, how we uh, develop innovative solutions uh, to the challenges in and around the recruitment of teachers in particular parts uh, of the country. Um, as a government, we have supported a partnership between Dumfries and Galloway Council uh, and the University of West of Scotland to offer a route into teaching for existing local authority uh, employees. And 10 students started on that programme, I'm pleased to say, last month, and we will be discussing the potential uh, to build on this model with both the local authority and the university. Uh, briefly, please, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. On the subject of centrally mandated targets, can I ask what plans the Scottish Government has to increase the extent to which local authorities are held to account on the outcomes as opposed to the inputs for the public? Um, if, if, I, if I caught Mr Buchanan's uh, question right, I think he is touching on an important relationship um, of how we need balance in our education system and the debates around um, how much resources and teacher numbers go into the system is indeed uh, very important um, and this government's position on uh, teacher numbers uh, has been uh, well rehearsed uh, here this afternoon. But I think the point that he um, is making that actually at the end of the day it's about outcomes for our children uh, and as a government uh, we are determined to be led and informed by the evidence about what works to improve uh, educational outcomes for all the children. Many thanks. Question number 12, Michael McMahon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government uh, when it last met with the Scottish Funding Council and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Uh, officer, I met with the Chair and Chief Executive of the Scottish Funding Council on the 24th of September. Uh, we discussed matters of importance to further and higher education. Michael McMahon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that recently the Scottish Funding Council uh, rejected a bid from the University of West of Scotland uh, to uh, have a fi financial assistance uh, to or rebuild its Lanarkshire campus in Hamilton. She may not be aware, though, can I ask her if she is aware, uh, that the local Chamber of Commerce rec recently estimated that the existence of that campus in Hamilton contributes an estimated £70 million to the local economy. Given that UWS now are considering options which may involve relocating away from uh, that, their current Hamilton base, 
Can I ask the, the Cabinet Secretary, um, will she argue with the, cabinets, the C Cabinet Secretary for Finance to find some money from the underspend that's recently been exposed to invest in that much needed campus on the current site in Hamilton to ensure that the economic, uh, adverse economic impact of this uh, decision by the Scottish Funding Council can be reversed and that the UWS can start to go ahead with its very exciting and competitive uh, project on the Hamilton campus site, please. My Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, I, I of course understand uh, the value of having a university campus in a town uh, and I understand uh, why any community uh, would want to retain a university campus uh, in, in their town. And I know that Mr McMahon, like other constituency members such as uh, C Christina McKelvey, um, have been taken a wee, have been taken a, a close have been taking a close uh, interest okay, uh, in the redevelopment uh, of the University uh, of West of Scotland uh, Hamilton uh, campus. I apologise if my geography of Lanarkshire is not quite um, as smart as it should be, uh, Mr McMahon, but I think it's clear that there is a cross-party interest uh, in the Chamber uh, with regards to the University of West of Scotland uh, and proposals uh, in and around where the campus uh, should be uh, located. Uh, UWS is uh, looking at an options uh, appraisal. Um, I know that at a local level, um, again, councillors across the political divide you know, appear to be united on this uh, matter as well. What I would say is that the Scottish Funding Council, while they were unable to um, uh, deploy £25 million to match fund uh, proposals uh, at this point in time, they have indicated that they are supportive uh, of the project and that the redevelopment of the UWS Hamilton campus uh, will feature uh, as one of the highest priorities uh, when they um, you know, publish uh, and develop their um, infrastructure um, investment, investment plan. Thank you. Question number 13, Chick Brodie. Yeah, thank you, <coughs> Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages the role that families can play in their children's learning and what it is doing to increase the quality of early learning and childcare services. Minister Aileen Campbell. We know that parents are the biggest influence on the future outcomes of our children and that supporting them is essential and that's why we are investing 2.7 million in Bookbug and Playtop Read activities this year for preschool children and why we launched Read Write Count in August. This programme aims to improve literacy and numeracy skills for children in primaries 1 to 3. Chick Brodie. Yeah, I thank the uh, Minister for our answer. Save the Children recently submitted the evidence to the Education Committee on the delivery of the families and schools together, the FAST programme focusing on parents disadvantaged by poverty to positively engage in their children's learning. What can the Scottish Government do to ensure that FAST, the FAST programme continues to prosper and would it consider producing national standards on parental engagement support? Minister. Um, I thank the member for raising this. I've seen firsthand the FAST programme in action in Western Bartonshire and was impressed by what I saw because it built on parents' assets and provided a really positive experience for both children and their families and I understand has helped improve outcomes for children. Uh, we'll consider the evidence from the FAST evaluation and we'll continue to work with Save the Children to consider the role that FAST and other similar parental engagement methods can play in our attainment programme. And with respect to the proposal for national standards, the government works with the national National Parent Involvement Stakeholder Group in order to monitor and develop national policy on parent engagement. Uh, the group is currently developing its work plan for 2016 onwards and will invite Save the Children to a future meeting of the group in order to consider the full range of ways to increase the quality, the breadth and the depth of parent engagement and family learning. Many thanks. Question number 14, Dave Thompson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is in the closure of rural schools and nurseries. Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so rural schools and nurseries are often highly valued by their community. It is important that any proposal to close one is given full consideration and complies with the requirements of the Schools Consultation Scotland Act 2010, which were strengthened uh, in 2014. Dave Thompson. Uh, the CAB secondly will, will know that Highland Council has mothballed Edinburgh and Struan nurseries and is appealing in favour of closure of Knockbreck, Edinburgh and Struan primaries on the Isle of Skye. They are doing this to try to block reopening of the nurseries or using that as an excuse. 
Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that this arrogant behaviour by Highland Council all becomes a supposed democratic organisation which should deal with the case of the nurseries on their own merits? Cabinet Secretary. Um, of course, President Officer, I agree that um, nurseries are essential to communities uh, and indeed uh, to our, our children in terms of their uh, well-being and uh, ed education. I am aware of this case and the sensitivities associated with it. Uh, however, as it is currently before the courts, uh, sign officer, you will appreciate it, I am limited in what I, I can say. Um, myself or Dr Allen would be more than happy to meet with Mr Thompson to discuss the issue further once the legal process uh, has concluded. Um, but until this matter is resolved, the, the Council may not implement its proposals either wholly or partly. Uh, in the meantime, we would expect the Council to meet its statutory obligations uh, relating to the provision of early learning and childcare. Briefly, please, John Scott. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the proposed closure of the nurseries at the Ayrshire College, and my constituents and I are particularly concerned about the proposed closure at Ayr College. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns about this and does she agree with me that further effort should be made to make this nursery viable, keep it available to students, staff and members of the public if need be? Is there anything she can do to help and also protect the jobs of the nine members of staff? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mr Scott will appreciate that this uh, very topic came up yesterday at uh, Topical Questions and uh, along with other local members I share uh, the disappointment uh, in this decision. Um, Ayrshire College advise um, that, the, um, that the nursery is currently um, economically unviable and uh, is costing uh, £400,000 to maintain and that nonetheless there are 37 children that, that, that currently use that and they also advise that the nine members of staff from the Cumberland campus uh, will be offered uh, redeployment. Uh, but I am you know, more than happy to meet with the member uh, and indeed any other uh, local member uh, to discuss uh, their concerns uh, on this matter. Question number 15, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Unison Scotland survey claiming that staff morale at colleges is at rock bottom with 79% of respondents saying staff felt negative or extremely negative. Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, sir, uh, much of the progress made in recent years in Scotland's colleges has only been possible because of the commitment and professionalism of staff. And I want to make sure that we build upon this while making sure staff are well led and supported. As the First Minister made clear last week, it is important to fully understand why some staff say they are dissatisfied and I intend to discuss these findings uh, with Unison Scotland uh, at our next meeting. Jim Hume. Uh, thank you very much. In interesting that the, the Cabinet Secretary calls it progress because we know that 65 per cent of staff feel that services have got worse in the last two years. Part-time colleges places have been slashed. There are 80,000 fewer female students compared with a few years ago. Will the Minister now finally concede that, one, this is not progress, two, the Government has got it badly wrong and their agenda of college with, their, uh, with their agenda of college mergers and funding cuts. This is bad for staff and it's extremely bad for access to flexible further education, particularly for female students. And so will the uh, Cabinet Secretary consider it's now time to restore uh, the college support and funding? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, um, although there were, I'm conscious that there were 266 members of support staff across the sector that responded to this survey, and while that is a, a low proportion of staff, nonetheless, uh, I am very keen to discuss the findings of this survey uh, when I next uh, meet with Unison. But it is nonetheless important to recognise that the college reform programme is a good example of public sector reform um, because we are doing more for learners in the context of a very challenging uh, financial times. And we now have more learners studying full-time recognised courses that lead to employment. And the focus on skills for work and the local economy are absolutely uh, the right uh, priorities. And with regards to the point that 
uh, he raises with respect to uh, women learners. Uh, women form the majority of college students, over 52% uh, uh, in 2013-12. Women are not underrepresented uh, in uh, the college sector. And in terms of the numbers uh, of under 25 studying uh, full-time uh, recognised courses, in, in terms uh, of over 25s uh, studying full-time recognised courses, and in terms uh, of women uh, studying uh, full-time uh, recognised courses, the trajectory is upwards. But of course, we still continue to provide a range of provision, uh, including uh, part-time provision as well, as we recognise that some people continue to need uh, that more flexible uh, approach to learning. A very brief supplementary, please, from Gordon MacDonald. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Given that pay scales are of concern to staff, could the Cabinet Secretary outline what progress the college sector has made on paying the living wage? And very briefly, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, certainly, President Officer. Um, I understand from Colleges Scotland that uh, all colleges have made a commitment to pay uh, the living wage, and I warmly welcome uh, this undertaking and uh, look forward to further colleges becoming living wage uh, accredited employers in the future. Thank you. We now turn to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 14432 in the name of Kenneth Gibson on Scotland's fiscal framework. Could I invite members who would like to be considered to speak?